Good morning, everybody. First of all, can I thank the organisers for inviting me to speak this morning. It's a shame that we can't all be together. I'm going to talk about a small hill fort in Denbyshire called Moligar Budfari, which we excavated a few years ago and are currently writing up. Um, a little bit of background. First of all, this project uh, grew from the Heather and Hill Forts project that many of you will know about. This was run by Fiona Gale of Denbyshire County Council, and it looked at six hill forts doing some earthwork survey and small scale geophysics in the um, Cluidian, Cluidian Hills, the Cluidian area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, growing from this, there were a couple of other projects besides Bonfari, one by Ray Carl looking at enclosures around Caird Druin, and Rachel Pope from Liverpool, who was excavating at Penny Clothiae, which, as you can see from the map, is the next hill fort down the range from Molnigai Bonfari, which is the northernmost and wasn't included in the Denbyshire County Council project. Um, Bodfari has often been described as a strategic location. It's situated at the um, confluence of the um, River Huayla and the River Cluid. And you can see the views here in different directions. So looking south down the Cluidian Range, and you can see Penny Clodii Hill Fort there, and then looking west across the Vale of Cluid. Um, Bodvari is, is sort of a difficult site to understand topographically. You can see from the Google Earth image that really there's not very much visible in terms of, of ramparts and ditches. And this is the 19th century first edition Ordnance Survey map, which gives a hint of ramparts down the western side, but doesn't give very much detail about the eastern side at all. It's quite common these days to use LIDAR data to try and get a better idea of top topography. And certainly that's what we did. This is fairly standard analytical hill shading. So here you get a much better idea of the Western run of ramparts and ditches that you can see around there. And you also get a hint of a rampart on the Eastern side there. And you can see that by changing the angle of the sun and the altitude, you get various images uh, which give you different sorts of information. By far the most useful thing that we found was to actually manipulate um, the, the raw LIDAR data. And here we use software to do something called multi-scalar curvature. And so here you can see that the red represents the tops of slopes and the blue represents the bottom of slopes. So you can see the tops of the ramparts in the northwest quadrant, for example, there's two ramparts and then a counterscarp ditch. And in the southwestern quadrant, you can see the same, whereas along the eastern side, there's just a single rampart. Um, Notice that the, the new earthwork survey that we did um, ties in with the LIDAR using the multiscalar curvature. And that's because we use the LIDAR data in this form very much to help us do the earthwork survey because we have problems of heather, heather growth and, and not heather and bracken growth and various other things. So you can also see some small quarries inside the inner rampart here, which were probably Iron Age um, quarry scoops. So this is the earthwork survey that we ended up with based on the LIDAR compared to the second ordnance survey survey that you can see here. So there's much more detail. Um, so notice in the northwest quadrant, there are two ramparts with ditches and then a counterscarp bank without a ditch. This continues down the southwestern quadrant uh, with a break in the middle, which is an area of disturbance I'll talk about. The inner rampart um, is pretty much gone in the southwestern quadrant, but is represented by the top of a break of slope.
And on the eastern side, there appears to be just a single rampart, but a great deal of damage due to ice flocking and quarrying. Notice the northern interned entrance with this bastion feature that you can see there, but that's the western intern and that is the eastern intern. We did uh, um, quite a lot of geophysics, both resistivity and magnetometry. The magnetometry was most useful. And here you can see the runs of the ramparts. The various straight lines that you can see are post-medieval agricultural activity that took place on the top of the hill. Um, there, was, um, there, there were some small scale excavations in the early 20th century, um, done by a man named Stapleton, a local school teacher with some of his pupils. Um, he wrote a report published in Art Camp, um, but it's quite difficult to establish exactly where his trenches were. He dug a hole through a V-shaped ditch and you can see his section there and that is somewhere around about here. And what I'll talk about in a little bit in a more detail is this area of disturbance in the middle of the western ramparts where he claimed there was an entrance. Now Stapleton concluded with this, if anything can be learned from an exploration which yielded nothing in the shape of a find, it is perhaps that Moli Gaia was at least never occupied by the Romans. Well, I'd certainly agree with that. And then he says, further than this, the evidence will not carry us. Well, hopefully we've got a bit more evidence which will carry us a little further. So we excavated six trenches that you can see here. And I'm very briefly going to talk about trench one where there's a possible roundhouse. Trench six, the northern intern entrance. Trench five, um, Stapleton supposed entrance and the, the ramparts. And trench three, which goes across uh, particularly the outer rampart. So looking at trench one in a bit more detail, this is the geophysical survey. And here you can see this penannular circular feature showing in the geophysics as a positive anomaly. And out of the whole of the interior of the hill fort, this is the only indication of a possible roundhouse. It's situated on this artificial terrace just inside the northern intern entrance. This is a plan of Trench One. You can see the roundhouse. And then the second main feature is this stone bank that goes around the lip of the terrace with a possible entrance through it there. Uh, this is the, ex the um, terrace you can see and it's cut into the bedrock and then producing uh, a flat surface that the possible roundhouse was built onto there. Here you can see a laid surface around the outside of the roundhouse. Um, this is the bedrock cut back at the back of the terrace and there was a whole series of, of, of lumps of this clayey red material which followed the, the geophysical anomaly. And we think this was warm material, um, possibly representing some kind of carb or clay warming of the roundhouse. There was also an area of flooring um, that you can see there. And one of the two finds of the whole excavation, both of which were stone spindle whirls, was found just outside the roundhouse, suggesting some kind of domestic activity going on there. Um, outside the roundhouse, around the lip of the terrace, you can see this stone built bank. And this is one of the rear revetting stones. And there was a radiocarbon date that you can see there from the very basal layer of this, of this, um, this stone bank. I refer to it as a possible roundhouse because although I think if you put together all of these little bits of evidence, then it, it probably was a roundhouse, although the evidence was quite difficult to interpret and not terribly convincing in places when you look at the evidence for other Iron Age roundhouses. 
Um, trench three, this is the rampart that you can see there, which is still standing. Um, this is an ortho photo and the traditional section drawing of the, of the section through this rampart. So here you can see the ditch, which is a rock cut ditch there. And the rampart has an outer face built from the local shale and then an inner face in two different phases, phase one and phase two of the inner face. And then a possible phase three is this revetting bank, this pile of shale uh, beneath the phase, uh, behind the phase two face. So this is the V-shaped ditch cut into the bedrock. And there are definite collapse levels within this ditch which represent the larger stones from the outer face of the rampart. So this is the outer face of the rampart in section. There was then a berm and then the V-shaped rock cut ditch. These are the two phases of the inner face of the rampart on slightly different alignments, as you can see there. And on the, the basal layer in the basal layer between beneath these phases of, of um, rampart inner face, we had these radiocarbon dates from charcoal, which we think was from burning and clearance when they leveled the surface to build this phase two inner face. This is a section photograph. So there you can see the phase one inner face, the phase two inner face, and this is the phase three revetting bank with some kind of stone baffle in the interior of it. If we now move on to trench five, this is the disturbed area in the middle of the western run of ramparts that you can see there. You can see that the ramparts are, are flattened and destroyed in this area. Whereas going up into the northwestern quadrant, there is an extant quite large rampart. This is a plan of Trench 5, which is a little bit um, detailed, but I'll briefly try and explain it. So it's an important area because it shows the junction of a phase one rampart, which runs down here with an entrance, and a phase two rampart which follows the line of the phase one rampart up to this point, but then swings round in a different direction here and doesn't have an entrance, despite Stapleton's area of digging there, doesn't have an entrance and in effect blocks the phase one entrance. Notice that the phase two um, rampart cuts across the outer face of the phase one rampart. And notice also that the phase one rampart entrance has got a nice sort of end to the rampart there. And it's got this little um, possible guard chamber or entrance recess that you can see there. So this is the main section through both the phase one and phase two rampart as an ortho photo. So this is the outer face of the phase one rampart that you can see there, very nicely co constructed. Um, the phase one rampart is this redder material, it's a refetting bank behind this outer face. And then the phase two rampart has more material piled on the top of it, together with this inner revetting wall, which, which curves round and goes onto the top of the phase two material that you can perhaps just see in that slide. This is the crucial bit. This is where the phase one rampart outer face that you can see there is actually cut across by the phase two rampart that you can see there. This is the inner face of the phase two rampart. So it cuts through the phase one rampart and swings off in a different direction. Um, these are the surviving features of the phase one rampart, which was basically removed the phase one rampart, but there was still this bit of the entrance surviving there. 
and there was this little guard chamber or entrance recess as they could sometimes called these days uh, this area with a little quarry ditch on the inner side of the phase one rampart so there it's phase one and phase two phase one goes down there whereas phase two shoots off in this direction and completely blocks the phase one entrance. If we now quickly look at the northern interned entrance, here you can see it from the bottom of the hill. This is it um, from inside the hill fort. This is the western larger intern with a sort of bastion feature and the eastern intern is a much lower, much more eroded uh, feature that you can see there. So this is the plan of the excavation trench and there was a deeper slot along the northern side and in the bottom, and it, this wasn't fully excavated, but in the bottom of the deeper slot was a phase one rampart with an inner face there and an outer face there. This was then completely um, destroyed and material piled over the top of it. And the phase two entrance is this hooked intern that you can see there. So that's the hooked intern of the phase two intern entrance. And there's a gate post hole at the end of it there, a big post hole. Um, this is the phase one rampart inner face, which is deeper down. And this is the phase two hooked intern that you can see there. So this deeper slot is at that northern end there. So what does that leave us with? It leaves us with a two phase enclosure. The first phase, it was a univallate enclosure as you can see, represented by the dark line here. Um, and that had both a Western entrance, which we saw with the little guard chamber, and it had a Northern entrance um, that we saw beneath the phase two um, hooked entrance. Um, and we're awaiting dates for, for this phase one of the enclosure. We've got six radiocarbon dates. Um, being processed at the moment. The second phase saw, saw multivallation. So in the northwestern quadrant, the phase one rampart was heightened and continued in phase two. The northern entrance was enhanced and that's the hooked into northern entrance. In the northwestern quadrant, as well as the inner rampart, there was a newly constructed outer rampart together with a counter scarp bank with no ditch. The counter scarp bank continues around the southwestern quadrant. But in the southwestern quadrant, the inner rampart was completely removed and destroyed. So all that was left was the single rampart and the counter scarp. So in effect, it's still univalate in the southwestern quadrant. Um, although it's now got a counter scar bank. On the eastern side, we don't really know very much about it at all, but certainly the slope is much steeper and <coughs> it appears that there's only a single rampart. Perhaps the reason for this multivallation in the northwestern quadrant, <coughs> excuse me, is that the approach to the rampart is much more gentle. The approach to the hill fort is much more gentle in this area than it is in this area. And perhaps that's why they had sort of enhanced um, ramparts there. Also part of this second phase based on the radiocarbon date so far is the building of, of the roundhouse just inside the northern entrance on that terrace. <clears throat> so the interim conclusions of this work, and we're still writing it up, is that first of all, interestingly, the geophysics did seem to work. There was some debate as to whether geophysics would work on this geology, but it certainly showed one roundhouse. And if it shows one, then there's a question as to whether there are other roundhouses, which it doesn't show, or whether there's just the one. 
Um, the one round house had a suggestion of domestic activity and therefore occupation of uh, some description with the, with the spindle whirl, and we've got some kind of phasing for the ramparts. Of course, as with, with any hill fort excavation, there are bigger questions. The social and economic relationships with other Cluidian hill forts. And here we're sort of waiting for the results of the Peniclodii excavations. Peniclodii, which is the next hill fort along the Cluidians, but it's huge. It's much, much bigger than Bodfari. Bodfari is only two hectares. And also at um, Peniclodii, there is much more evidence for roundhouses. We know very little about other types of sites in this area, which could have been contemporary with Bodfari and Peniclodii and the, the other hill forts. Were people living down in the Vale of Cluid? Were these sites primarily for summer occupation and summer use? Was there some kind of transhumance going on in the Cluidians with animals being moved up there? Um, which, which leads us on to the big question with hill forts. What was the function of them? Um, the traditional view is that they were defensive, but were they just defensive if they were at all? Were they permanently occupied or just occupied at certain times of the year. I'd just like to finish by saying that we had two artists in residence on the excavation who produced some very interesting work and created really stimulating discussions with the, with the diggers and the volunteers. This one is Simon Callery, who you can see laying um, big canvases down on the excavated trenches and cutting round the stones, producing this amazing bit of three-dimensional painting called Country Register. And this is Stefan Gant, who produced this digital palimpsest, which is based on the recording of thousands and thousands of um, trowel scrapings, which were then converted into different lengths of line um, using, using digital technology. And both of these works of art were displayed um, at a gallery on the Fri Peninsula towards the end of the project. Um, there I'd like to finish, so thank you very much for listening. Just to say that this work will be published in Archaeologia Cambrensis in 2022, next year. Thank you.